So far in our reproduction unit, we've focused on how humans and other eukaryotes transfer genetic information. In this video, we're going to switch gears a little bit and focus on prokaryotes, bacteria, and how they transfer genetic information. Let's start by reviewing the structure of a prokaryotic cell. Here's a typical bacterial cell. Many things are in common with eukaryotes. They have a cell membrane, ribosomes, DNA, and cytoplasm. Prokaryotes also have a cell wall surrounding the cell membrane. They have a region in the center where the DNA is found, and this is called the nucleoid. The nucleoid is not a separate compartment like the nucleus, it's just a space within the cell. Bacteria also have pili, these little projections that help them attach to surfaces and other cells. Some bacteria will have a capsule surrounding their cell wall for added protection, and some will have a flagella, a long tail to help them move. The prokaryotic genome has a couple unique features. Instead of many linear chromosomes, like humans, they have one large circular chromosome, and then smaller loops of DNA called plasmids. And those plasmids are important because they can replicate independently and they contain many genes, some of which could provide helpful traits like resistance to antibiotics. So how do prokaryotes reproduce? Well, they do something called binary fission, and this is very simple. One cell, the parent, duplicates its chromosomes during DNA replication and then splits into two identical cells. So this is an asexual form of reproduction. It's similar to mitosis, but it's not the same because prokaryotes don't have a nucleus to divide. This is also known as vertical gene transfer. In fact, any type of reproduction is vertical gene transfer because DNA is being passed from the parent down the line to the daughter cells. Quick note about prokaryotic DNA replication. In eukaryotes, because there's so much DNA, DNA replication starts at multiple points along the chromosomes. There are multiple origins of replication. That way it gets done faster. But prokaryotes have less DNA, and they have only one origin of replication. Another unique thing about prokaryotic protein synthesis is that transcription is immediately followed by translation. And this is because there's no nucleus to separate the DNA from the ribosome. So the DNA is transcribed by RNA polymerase into RNA, which is directly translated by the ribosome into a polypeptide. So if bacteria reproduce asexually, why aren't they all identical? Well, bacteria have some pretty interesting mechanisms to increase genetic variation, and it's these mechanisms that have allowed them to become antibiotic resistant. The first mechanism is also found in eukaryotes, and that's mutations. Most mutations in bacteria are spontaneous due to errors in DNA replication. Some mutations, however, can be induced by the environment, such as chemicals, radiation, other mutagens. Keep in mind that these mutations could be neutral, harmful, or helpful by providing antibiotic resistance. Now here's where bacteria are unique. Bacteria can do something called horizontal gene transfer. And this is not like vertical transfer, parent to offspring. This does not involve reproduction. Rather, one adult bacteria can transfer some of its genes to another bacteria, which is something humans definitely can't do. If your friend has an eye color you really like, your friend cannot give you their gene for that eye color and give you a new trait. Not gonna happen. But bacteria can do it, partly with the help of something known as transposons. These are jumping genes that can easily move from one location to another location. It could be a new part of the chromosome. It could be an entirely new cell. So there are three methods that bacteria use to transfer their genes horizontally. One we've seen before, transformation, and this was demonstrated in Griffith's experiment. A bacterial cell can take up a naked piece of DNA from the environment. In this case, or in Griffith's experiment, it was a gene that coded for a pathogenic uh, property. So let's say this is the R plus gene. It could enter the cell and then become part of the chromosome. The second method is a little more complex because it involves viruses. 
So here we have a donor bacterium. It's the donor because it's going to donate its gene to another cell inadvertently. We also have a phage virus. Remember that phages are viruses that infect bacteria. So this virus is infecting this bacteria, and here you can see it inserting some viral DNA. This larger blue loop, however, is the bacterial DNA. Now what happens is, once the viral DNA is inside, it takes over the bacterial cell and uses the cell to make more little viruses. But something interesting happens. Those viruses, as they're being built, pick up a little bit of the bacterial DNA. And so you can see that little bit of bacterial DNA in the viruses. So then, when the viruses are released, here's what happens. One of those new viruses might infect a different cell. This is the recipient cell. And when it infects that cell, not only does the viral DNA go inside, but the bacterial DNA from the donor also enters. And it can become part of the recipient's chromosome. So here we can see that that R plus gene from the donor is now in the recipient. Here's a summary of that process. And keep in mind, that gene that gets transferred by the virus could give antibiotic resistance or make the bacteria pathogenic. The final method is conjugation. And during conjugation, there are again two cells, a donor cell and a recipient cell. The donor cell is referred to as the male cell and the recipient as female, but they're not really male and female. So what happens here is that the donor cell uses sex pili to attach to the recipient cell. And then a mating bridge forms between the two cells. And then finally, some DNA from the donor can copy and then pass into the recipient cell. So this, unlike transduction, is direct transfer of DNA from a donor bacterium to the recipient bacterium. And it involves the sex pili with the mating bridge. Note, however, this is not sexual reproduction because these two bacteria are not making a new bacterial offspring. They're simply sharing genetic information. And that genetic information could be a gene for antibiotic resistance, could be a gene that makes the bacteria pathogenic. And that concludes our exploration of how bacteria transmit genetic information.